And we are live. Uh, hello, everybody on Facebook. Um, hope you're having a good uh, evening, uh, afternoon, morning, wherever you are tuning in for this live stream. Uh, welcome to the anatomy of a remix session with myself, Paul DeCane. Uh, this is looking at the remix I did in 2014 uh, of uh, Blue Monday, uh, New Order, the seminal track. So basically what I'm going to do today is to break it down, show you the individual parts, give you a bit of background about some of the uh, methodology behind doing the remix and um, you know how the track was built up and what was kept in mind to actually make a remix of a, such a classic track while maintaining its integrity but making it for a more modern audience. <clears throat> so uh, if you, a few of you could just maybe just give me a thumbs up and let me know that my voice is okay. I've done some testing before on this but you should be able to hear me okay now. So I'm just going to change this around a bit so we can see the screen. Right, okay, let's uh, dive straight into this. Give you a bit of background about the, the remix. First of all, um, I acquired the parts. I won't say how I managed to get them. Um, but um, the original parts were not available in their full broken down format. Uh, if you look at this particular uh, logic window here, this is a, a, a version which was taken from, I believe, the stems that, was, that were produced by uh, Quincy Jones back in 1988. And if you look at this section here, you can see that everything's been comped to uh, uh, different stem, stems. So, so for example, uh, most of the drums have been burned into one audio file. Most of the bass, likewise. The synths are all together, which would mean the pads and all the synths, uh, the rhythmic synths, the vocal, uh, and the vocoder have been put together, all of the bass sounds and uh, everything else. So basically, I didn't have access to every single part of this because this was the only multi-track that was available. But the interesting thing is, is that the original, either the original version was recorded at 120 BPM and in a different key. Um, so just to give you an idea of this, I'll, I'll play this version here and you can hear it. Uh, just, just check this out, see what you think to this. Now that's going to sound like somebody's put a piece of vinyl on and just turned the pitch down. And that's exactly what it is. If anybody takes the uh, the vinyl version of Blue Monday and takes the pitch down to, to minus eight percent, the musical key um, and the tempo put, puts it exactly where it is now. And you can hear this here. Okay, so the actual bass line on the uh, version that we have here, the stems, is uh, I think it's about C sharp minus seventh. So the, the actual bass notes are E, B, C sharp, F sharp, B, and C sharp. Yet in the version that we hear, that we know, it's 130 BPM. And in the key of D minor, and the bass is in F, C, D, and then G, C, and D. So that's an interesting thing just to point out. So that's the background of you know, where it started. I mean, obviously I had to change the tempo into something that was more housey, more usable. So I had to change the pitch, uh, the tempo of the uh, audio files and the actual uh, musical key as well. Relatively simple process in Logic. I don't, I, this isn't about the technicalities of that. This is about the methodology and the reasoning behind the remix, but just to give you a bit of background. Uh, and of course the original uh, was very bass light. I think it, the, the, the lowest bass region was about 100 Hertz. So there wasn't a lot of bass in the record uh, and a lot of tracks in, in those days, uh, sort of 1983. Anyway, that's that's a, just a bit of a background about the original uh, parts, but it's, I, I think it's quite unusual uh, and not a lot of people know that the original seemed to be, maybe it was recorded at 120 in that key and then the guys just sped it up on the, on the uh, final master tape or whether there's some anomaly in the process between the parts being passed to Quincy Jones and then... So there's a bit of background on that. So I'll just, uh, oh, and the one thing I wanted to do while I've got this particular part up, uh, the track um, on the 12 inch vinyl ends with a fade and on the original parts, it didn't. And it ended with a kind of a dead stop. And I don't think anybody has actually heard this before. So I'm just gonna give you uh, a little preview of that just as a, a quick, a little bit of fun. So 
there you go. That's how the original multi-track or the original song was intended to re, uh, to end. But of course, on the record, uh, it, it, it faded out. So I'll just move this uh, this version out of the way for a moment and bring in my mix. Okay, uh, let's put this full screen. Everything okay so far? All good? So, 2014. So I had the remix parts here. Now, what you're seeing on screen here, I'll just um, focus in on or zoom in on a few of these files. These are all rendered audio files. The computer that had the original programming on has been uh, damage lost or something's happened in the past but when i went on the road to do uh, this remix uh, session with uh, colleges and academies and industry events i couldn't take my entire plug-in vst musical instrument library with me on a laptop so i rendered out the files the audio files so they all sound uh, great and but they're all audio level wise in place so that's why the audio files don't look as high in in uh, the waveform as perhaps you would expect because these are bounced in place to basically show uh, everybody you know the, the actual individual parts so just just wanted to let you know about that okay so let's jump back to um, uh, my version right so 2014 remix how do I go about doing a remix what are the things that I bear in mind okay with with a track like this it's seminal it's classic you know I didn't want to just take uh, Barney's vocal and a bass line and put some house drums behind it and call it a day with 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 remixes my philosophy most of the time has been to give the essence to to respect the essence of the musicianship of the original uh, but bring it to a more contemporary audience but also to uh, give it a, a structured arrangement that that kind of 50 percent meets the structure of the song and, and 50 percent meets the kind of needs of a dance floor with the dynamics etc so i always bear this in mind when i'm when i'm doing a remix also, I, I learned that I'm going to give this tip that was passed to me. I did a, I took a trip in 1990 um, with uh, um, John, John Saunderson, who was looking after me for DMC management at the time. And he introduced me to a few people in New York. And I wanted to hunt down Francois Kavorkian to have a, a chat with him. He was one of my remix heroes. I managed to get an audience with him. And he gave me one solid piece of advice, which I'm going to pass on to you guys. And that's always to put something unusual in a track that people will will say, you know, how did he do it? Uh, I wasn't expecting it. Uh, where's that sound from? That's a different way of looking at something. So in every single remix, I try and put something that's unusual uh, or quirky, whether it be a sound that's specifically programmed or a type of drum sound or, or an effect. Um, or in this case, um, which you'll hear very soon, uh, taking some of the elements of the vocal and making a new version. So as if Barney had actually sung a different version. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that later. But in the essence, uh, that, that's the way I look at a remix. So what you're looking at here on the, on the screen is the basic structure of, of the song. Um, just to give those who don't know, this is a DAW, Digital Audio Workstation. The program is called Logic. But just to give those who don't fully understand you know, the, what they're seeing here, Basically, on the left-hand side are all the uh, instruments uh, or all the sequences. So drums, percussion, bass, um, clavinets, transitions, snares, everything is all on the left-hand side named. So horizontally across are all the channels of uh, one particular sound. So, for example, here, uh, this is a recreation of the uh, Moog sound. So I'll just um, zoom into that so you can hear... So all along, um, all along the track here will be the bass. So on the on the horizontal axis. So all along here would be uh, the bass line running from left to right in a linear fashion. So it goes from left beginning to the right at the end. So that's that's that vibe. And then um, vertically, the structure would be uh, what's happening where. So to give you a better understanding of this, I've just made a few uh, diagrams, which I'll switch to now. Um, preview that's it okay so hopefully this will give you a bit of better uh, indication of how the, the 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 actual remix is structured if you look at the uh, vertical lines you can see that the sections are quite clear from the left hand side dj mixing intro then it runs into uh, intro bass break uh, the drums and the instrumentals come in the lead vocal comes in the the bass change with a mini break lead vocal section two a slight change with a guitar section lead vocal section three a fade break. Uh, I mean, these, these. I'll play you these a bit later on, but it gives you a visual in, uh, understanding about you know how these things are laid out. A rhythm revisit, a bass energy break and hike, uh, and sixteenth note kick, 
and then a climax ending with the does it feel voice. So that gives you a kind of understanding of what, what you're looking at on the screen. Uh, also, you'll see where I've, I've just added, highlighted here, there are some elements in green, which are transition sections. Now these audio waveforms transition from one section into another and so give it a kind of a cohesion and um, smooth flow as, as one section goes into another. So there's three elements here, guitars, a clav, and a groove at the end. So you can see how those transition, uh, the, they, they straddle the actual sections of the track. I mean, when you're dancing to a track or listening to it, you don't envisage this, but from a production level, this is the way to kind of map out the journey of, of, of a song or of a track, a remix. This shows you the left to right side. So I, I always arrange different colors. Um, you can see that I've got certain colors and it goes in a certain order from top down. You, the, the drums and the percussion are at the top. Underneath is the Moog, uh, the bass, I'm sorry. Uh, then the lead vocal. So those three elements are always visually for me, I know exactly where they are. It's always the drums and percussion at the top, then the bass, then the vocal. Then the instrumentation comes in. Now, let me just flip back to this. You can see here, so drums and percussion at the top, the bass, the vocals, and the instruments. Um, so if you just take some time and have a look at that, and then at the bottom is all the, the fairy dust in, the crashes, the effects, the transition, all the things that just give it the, you know, the whooshes, the bangs, the crashes. So this gives you a visual interpretation going from um, the, the original version down to this. So again, vertical sections are the uh, sections of the song. The transition elements that cross over and then the left to right elements the or the, the blocks of elements that give you so that's a hopefully that's a, a good tip to help you arrange um <clears throat> help you arrange uh, your tracks throughout so the drums and percussion so basically let's have a look at how this actually forms so we'll solo the, dr the kick drum at the moment so with the kick drum basically um with any kick drum uh, it has to have the percussion the low element but especially in the days of uh, people listening to on smart speakers and devices, there always needs to be an element of the mids in the kick, like a click or something that's in the mid frequencies to give it that element. So when I'm, um, I would always encourage you guys, I mean, I know it's, it's so easy to go get sample packs and download loops and everything and just throw them in. But by doing so, what, what you're actually doing is um, creating, uh, is, is just, you know, use, using what everybody else is doing. So everything becomes kind of homogenized. So I'd always encourage you to make your own loops, et cetera, to, to make your own flavors. One of the things I, I was quite pleased about when I was DJing is that if I was ever in a club and I heard uh, a remix of mine, I could always tell it was mine by the drums, even before the bass or the vocal actually arrived. Try and, you know, make your own uh, percussion grooves, etc. but build the elements through the track. Uh, all of these, um, this percussion here has um, building different sections and I've cut them up actually so you can actually see them. So when you get them all running together, like this, I just... So there's the first layer. Here's the second. Sorry. Very subtle, just a little clav. And then the third element. So obviously there's little fills, etc., drops, but that gives you an idea of how the percussion is built up in different layers. And again, I'd encourage you to create your own loops rather than just dragging and drop them, uh, dropping them into tracks. I mean, yeah, when you need them, cool, do it, but try and bring some elements of originality into this. So that's the, the, the percussion side of this as this moves along. So let's look at the bass now. Um, now with the bass line, the elements that are, are relevant, uh, there's two uh, particular elements with the, uh, the bass line. Yeah, the straight eight section, which is the initial tease, and then the 16th section, which is the dum da da dum da dum you know, the kind of disco thing. And then uh, we've got different elements that sort of bounce around the track. So let's have a look at how that bass is, 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 is moved through the intro part of the track. So let's, uh, we'll go to the beginning and you can hear this, I'll play the whole track.
So this is quite interesting. What's happening here is the first dun 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 the first two notes of the of the actual bass line. So it's kind of a tension. So what's happening here is just using the the initial notes of the dun 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 dun. So it's just dun 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 holding that note. So it's a tension, and also it's filtered. So when um, we get to the section where the, it drops completely to the bass, the bass will come in full frequency and uh, with the full musical phrase. So it's like a double intensity. So check it out. Okay, so that's a, a nice way of introducing the bass sound rather than let it come in full on from the beginning, tease it, give it some anticipation, you know, give moments uh, in the track. So uh, the other elements of the bass line um, uh, are these. Uh, so as we move into the, uh, the vocal, um Okay, so what, where does the bass go next? Um, interesting, let's have a look at this here. So as we move a bit further into the song, uh, I'll play it with everything running and then we'll solo a few things. Okay, let's quiet that down and show you what's happening there. So if I put the vocal in as a reference and then listen to what happens with the actual bass programming. So what you're hearing now is a kind of a galloping bass, but what's happening is there's a note missing. So we've gone from the straight eights bass. But when we get the intensity of the galloping bass, there's a, there's a note missing. So it's giving away, it's not, it's a nice transition from the straight eights bass, but it's not going on, on the dun -dun 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 -dun. it's not like, like that kind of sequence. So it, it, it brings the, the tension up and the energy up, um, but it also holds something back for, for, to not kind of detract from the next section. Um, underneath uh, was a kind of um, uh, an element that was working with it, which is this new order bass growler. So I'll just play that for you. So it's this element here. Okay, looking a little bit further on, uh, these purple sections here are where that actual bass comes in. But this, the, the missing note here accommodates this bass growler effect because here where it's purple in this section, So it's very subtle, but again, it's it's the the transition to energy and not to sort of lose things, but to keep the tension building and building and the anticipation. So let's just check the the movement from. One one note missing, then the growl synth comes in and it makes the intensity go higher. And in a second, the bass growler will actually stop, but the full note comes in and you'll hear the difference. And there it is. That's just so, so powerful. Um, okay. Uh, what, what, by the way, I did say that this would be a fully interaction, uh, interactive session. Um, it's a little bit difficult to sort of like go through all the, all of the questions here, but what I'll do is um, just have a quick look through now, nothing majorly specific. So if you want to um, drop some questions in, please feel free to do. And if I can see them, I'll, I'll drag them in, we'll discuss it. Um, otherwise, what we'll do is take a, a Q&A at the end of, uh, of this uh, session. 
Okay, um, looking good so far. So we've looked at the percussion, we looked at the bass and the structure. Uh, quick look at the lead vocal. The, the lead vocal is combined from the original uh, Quincy Jones multitrack with the vocoder. So let's just have a quick listen to this. Okay, so you can hear that the vocoder is in there with, with this. So the vocal is structured. You can see where it is from left to right. We did, looked at the sections before. This is the first kind of vocal section, second, third. Uh, but what's happening over here? We've got two vocal sections. We've got uh, Barney's lead vocal and we've got the Vox effects and sequences. So this is where the elements come in that I was talking about earlier, where you bring in some kind of your own flavor, your own touch, still respecting the original track and the original performance, but taking some elements. And for me, the the whole, how does it feel? How do you feel? How does it, you know, this, this was always a thing for me or throughout all the many years I would hear it. So I use the vocal to create new transitions so we'll look at the two transitions and the the reasoning behind them so we go from about here That's energy. Um, okay, so let's let's have a look at the, the 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 way that how does it feel vocal was arranged and what exactly was happening there. So I, I, as you may have noticed, the the entire track began to fade out as the vocal sequence, the play of words, the resequencing of Barney's vocals actually happened. The uh, background track faded into the distance and I did that by assigning all the drums, percussion and synths and everything else to different buses, different uh, channels as it were on, on the uh, computer. Uh, and then I could bring them all down together in, in, in one, you know, four different groups. Anyway, so let's have a look at the vocal again and, and, and I'll keep the kick drum there just as a reference for the moment. But let's listen to the vocal and exactly what is going on here. Okay, so there's the three different versions of it. So, of course, that never actually appeared as a sequence in the original, but there's that touch. There's that kind of personal, your nod of respect, so my personal one, to that vocal and the elements that I felt always should have been there. But it's like Barney was in there actually recording this. Underneath, you can actually see this um, reverse uh, reverb. So what I did was I took the entire track that you can see here in blue, and I put a big reverb on it, turned the audio file around, and then left that in, in sequence underneath. And that creates that additional tension. So I'll just play that in full. How should I feel? 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 Okay, so um, yeah, it's a tried and trusted uh, method by many remixes, but it, it really works. So uh, yeah, the next section for the vocals is um, where uh, another treatment is given, but again, it, it, it has a reason to exist and it helps end the track in, in, in a very cool way. Oh, 
Okay, so uh, yeah, that's that's kind of a study of the vocal section uh, and um, using different elements to give different sequences and uh, punctuate these through the track to give them uh, kind of uh, help the structure of the track from, from top to bottom. Okay, I hope you're all enjoying this so far. Um, do pop some questions in, I'll try and keep an eye on that, uh, otherwise we'll take Q&A at the end. So the next section to look at would be uh, the guitars. So let's look at how they are actually running through the track. So with Hoppy's guitar, basically I waited until the first bass drop. Just jump forward. Okay, um, so with with um, Hookie's guitar, uh, the this obviously is is one of the most important parts. You don't mess with it. Um, but what I, what I did do uh, on this was some of the uh, notes were a bit lazy. Some of them were ahead of the beat. I'm pretty fastidious when it comes to sort of timing things out. I don't want to be too surgical about it. But uh, what I did was I used um, something in Logic called uh, Flex Time, and that basically slices up the uh, performance. And I was able to move certain notes that Hooky played more to the beat either backward or forward to give it a, a more kind of a precise feel other than that it's the performance as it is Okay, we'll, do, we'll carry on with that uh, in a second. Just a quick question from Mark Cooper uh, asking how, um, let's have a look, sorry. Uh, how do you wait until the mastering process to get that sound of so huge for the kick drum or do you tweak it later? Um, I kind of, um, as I'm going along, uh, rather than sort of uh, in, back in the days of having a, a traditional mixing desk and then we what we used to do after all the programming would flatten the desk and then do get our, you know, go for a break, get our head refreshed and then, do a mix, you know, bring it, bring bring all the tracks back up with new levels and new EQ and, and and stuff. I tend to kind of EQ and compress and do all the treatment to to everything and kind of build them up the mix up. So pretty much ninety eight percent of the time, by the time I've got to the end of, of a production, uh, I've, I've got the overall sound. So I just hope that answers your question. So jumping back to this, so the guitars. Let's look at the other sections that we have. Uh, we go here. Let's have a look. So that's another section. This diff again, I've coloured the audio files differently so that I, kn I know visually that they're different. So it's all pretty straightforward with with Hooky's guitars, but um, again, as you can see, the purple ones are one style, and the green ones or the teal ones are another one. Um, now then, confession: some of Hooky's guitars I wasn't too mad about. Um, basically, the uh, some of the guitars that he uses to respond to Barney's lead vocal uh, seemed to be. I don't know whether it was a different day session or whether he would had a couple of beers, but it was it was all over the place. There was very little consistency. Levels were up and down. Timing was a bit sloppy. Uh, no disrespect, Hooky, but uh, so I basically I thought, okay, well at this point, what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave those. We've got the main guitars in. The, these are cool. This is fine. The seminal ones are there. So I decided to. Um, change the uh the thing around so what, what i'll do is i'll just uh play the original one for a second 
Um, let's try and put this here. So uh, guitar, so where are we? Again, we're back to the 120 version in slower one in a different key. I'll just try and find the, uh, the guitars. Here we go. Um, Very strange hearing it at that tempo and at that key. But if you listen again to the guitar section I'm talking about, you can hear the kind of insist the like in inconsistency that that's there. So you heard that little bit where one note you kind of just disappeared. That's not too bad. But anyway, in essence, it goes through the track and it's not particularly on point. So um, I, uh, let's move this out of the way. Where are we? Back onto here. Um, hope you're all good. And any more questions? No, we're okay. So uh, what did I do to replace that? Looking at Barney's lead vocal. Um, so uh, I used um, this, the Pro One Answers. I'm gonna bring this actually back up here so I can see it. So when, um, to, to, to replicate that, I, I used the same notes. So basically I played what I, as close as I could to what um, Hooky was playing. So this is this is kind of vibe that you get. So I used a, a synth called a Pro One Sequential Circuits, a classic synth, and uh, made this. Laid your hands upon me and told me who you are. Thought I mistaken I thought I'd heard your words tell me how do I feel tell me now how do I feel okay so pretty straightforward but then by, by replaying those I have uh, consistency I have control of it and um, yeah it's it's just it's, it's one of the times when you can actually go okay perhaps the original performance I can do something different with or that's more appropriate for this remix. So that's that. Okay, let's look at the synth side of it, uh, the keyboards. Um, you remember from the previous uh, uh, thing I showed you. Uh, let's just go back to this. So instruments, if you look at this here that says instruments, we've got uh, guitars, uh, pads and strings, uh, and synths and keyboards. And you can see how in a linear fashion, they go right across from left to right uh, in the timeline of the track. So um, let's go back to logic and look at some of the sense. Now it's quite well known uh, and quite well documented that the uh, that New Order sampled and looped a section from Kraftwerk's Uranium track, basically uh, left that running and tuned and pitched it. So I, <laughs> I think I did the same from memory. This is 2014 when I did it. I, I don't have the original reference file, um, but I either did it or I recreated uh, what you're about to hear with all the choral stuff, the choirs, the strings, the Mellotron is, is, is um, it, well, actually it's a VST called the Mellotron and it's uh, originally made by G-Force and I think um, Arturia do a version as well. But most of these sounds, if I didn't take the choir, the Kraftwerk choir myself, maybe I did. I, I can't remember. But anyway, let's let's just listen to how the these build up. So here's the Kraftwerk choir, which, for the sake of argument, is Uranium or a loop from Uranium, which New Order used as well. So that's the loop there. And then, and then I'll bring in the the Mellotron. The Mellotron is an instrument uh, for those that don't know, which was basically choral loops uh, on tape that just looped around on a key. So every time a key was pressed, an actual tape loop went around a magnetic head. So this was like in the 1960s. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of uh, gear. So here's the strings. And then the top line strings as well. It's quite beautiful.
ethereal absolutely amazing okay let's just give that a bit of uh context here let's put the kick drum and the um bass line and just to give you something uh that you've not heard before Quite wonderful. Okay, so those are the um, choirs you can see from the timeline of the track. They appear at the beginning and the, uh, they take the track out. They don't need or aren't in the structure of the song anywhere else because you can see what's happening elsewhere. So the next musical element is the, um, the funky clav. So this is based on a, a clavinet. And again, um, what I've done, I think, with this, I think I've taken the original, um, uh, think one of the original lines, sampled the actual... Uh, sound and re-sequenced uh, it. Uh, I think I used either um, an EXS24 plugin in Logic uh, and then a MIDI file associated with it and then cut that up, or it may have been with Propeller Heads Recycle, but uh, who knows? Ask me another time. So let's have a listen to this. Let's put the kick drum in and you'll you'll start to recognize how this works and you'll you'll know the sound. So very straightforward, but again, just resequenced, tidied up, um, giving it a bit of EQ and uh, some nice delay and, uh, you know, control of the actual elements again. Now, the next synth is really interesting because, again, going back to the um, uh, kind of cult status of it and the story behind this is that on um, uh, one of the, the, the way that the original track grooves was actually a mistake. Um, so basically what Gillian did was she uh, her job was to sequence all these synth sounds throughout the track. And in those days, um, a, a sequencer would, a sequencer is a kind of a hardware box that would tell a keyboard to play from beginning to end a certain sequence of notes at a certain tempo. And I think basically she made a mistake in one of the um, uh, programming uh, sessions. And uh, I, I can show you, you know, what exactly what what happened and how I basically corrected it or, or gave it another another feeling. So the mistake section is here. Now let's uh, go through this and see if you can hear it. OK. OK, so I'm going to solo the uh, I'm going to solo the um, that actual synth sound uh, without any percussion and try and work out in your head where the rhythm is. So I'll put the kick drum in. So now it probably, first of all, it probably didn't sound like a mistake, but when you hear it with the kick drum now, try and get your head around this rhythm and work it out. So that, that was the mistake, but it was a kind of a serendipitous mistake because that actually gave the track an incredible groove. Uh, so that when you hear it like this, uh, if I put the bass line in, uh, it all of a sudden starts to uh, to make some, some sense. Let's have a look. Here we go. So now for some unknown magical reason, that mistake synthesizer works and it makes the groove. Okay, so how did I, did did I keep it? Did I change it? No, I changed it. Let's have a look at uh, what I did with it. So back to my version, 2014. Let's go here. Right, so let's have a look. I think this is the section. Let me have a look. No, that's not it. Uh, where is it? Here we go. Squiggle groove. This is the thing. Okay, we're actually over here. Sorry. Let's take you to this side of the song. Right. So this is my version of it.
Oh, have I got the right thing here? Actually, let me just. Sorry about this, guys. Let me just go back to the uh, the other the other version. Um, so many tracks, so many different things. Let's have a look. Um, Uh, confusion's raining here. Let's have a look. Is it, is it not the clav? One second, guys. Let me just get my head around this. Um... Oh no. Okay, so this is this is the section here. So I was right. This is this is the version. So I've got to find this one. Okay, right. Okay, bear with me, boys and girls. I will find this. Okay, anyway, I'm getting confused with it, but I, basically uh, there was a mistake made on the programming for the original and uh, I, I changed this one. I think I've got it right. I'm getting a bit confused with two sounds here. Yes, that's it, of course. <laughs> My apologies. The problem is, of course, the, the one we're listening to before is in a completely different key, so it's really down there and slow and a different tempo. So when I got to this version... Matt Ray, happy accident. Yeah, so this is, this is, sorry about the confusion there, guys. I, it totally threw me out. The, the, the version I was listening to is 120 BPM in, the diff, in a different key. Steve Anderson, I hope you, hope you, it's good to see that you uh, didn't notice that as well. I'm sure you can check the musical key for me and check that I had it right. So that's the reasoning behind that. So that's correcting Gillian's mistake, uh, as good as it was. Okay, we're back and we're running. So there we go. Now you can hear it in its full glory. And then you add in the clavinet. Then you get the full. There you go. Okay, so a bit of uh, brain damage there, Paul, but uh, we got there in the end. Okay, hope you're all enjoying it so far. Um, what time we got? As I said, we'd have to do this for an hour. I think we'll be going a bit longer but hopefully you're all enjoying it so that's cool so let's have a look what else is happening down here bright synths let's have a listen to this what's going on here down? so what is this sound here let's have a listen ah that's interesting okay so this really proves that the um from the quincy jones multi-track <clears throat> excuse me uh, that the all of the synths were bounced. Uh, if you listen very carefully to this, you'll hear the sort of uh, horn stab, the da -da -da. But listen again, and you'll hear the clavinet underneath it. So it just proves that that was uh, uh, all incorporated in one track. But, you know, hey, it sounds good. Um, so how does that actually work in context with the rest of the track? So let's listen to this section here. Oops, a daisy. Try it. Uh, go over here. Now you really, really get the intensity of this because if you go back to the the bass sound I was talking about, this sound that actually has got the missing note, and you add the growling bass underneath it. Now, when you put this horn stab section in, the intensity is, is, is insane. That, that ending's really cool, sort of like a portamento sound, a kind of slide right at the end is, uh, is very nice. Let's just listen to that again, because it's so sexy. 
No, 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 no. Here we go. I just love it. Fantastic. Okay, so we've covered uh, a lot of the main elements so far, and uh, you know why they were programmed, how um, how they run through the timeline. So let let's look at some other things now. Uh, there's quite a few uh, remix uh, remix of producer colleagues and friends on 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 the chat at the moment. Good to see you all here. Thanks for joining us, as as with everybody. Um, but one of the things that's um, kind of standard in the days when we started remixing, I guess in the in, in the in the eighties, uh, making effects transition. So, uh, peri- you know, we go back to the different sections in in a song. So I'll just shoot back to the diagram again, and go to here. So you can see with all these different sections. If you if you look at the bottom of the screen uh, around here, this is where these uh, effects transitions are just basically washes, swooshes, reverse sounds, effects that just punctuate throughout the track and give it that kind of movement and, and pace and and uh, momentum uh, and, and also take you from one section and kind of subliminally subliminally introduce you to the next section so let's have a look at, um, at, at some of those so we'll go down to uh, here I'll play this um, solo and you see you can hear the type of thing, things uh, that, that, we, that we use So there's one, uh, another one here. And here. Well, that's actually one of new orders, but we'll uh, look at those uh, later. So it's like loads of spaceships and things flying past you. It's all very subliminal, but hey, it's part of the part of the remix. So, um, yeah, that's all very cool. Uh, other elements are uh, crash symbols, basically these kind of things. Um, we're not on the, the boring bit now. We're, we're coming back to something quite more interesting than crash symbols and effects, but just wanted to play you these. So these, it's just like a, a symbol on, on the beginning of every four, eight, 16 bars. Um, so let's look at some of those uh, very seminal breaks uh, in the in the original track and, and what i'm going to do is i'm going to take you right back to the beginning with the kick drum because again uh, what i've done with i don't know whether uh, you, you'll hear this at the end when i play the track and Stuart, thanks for asking i will obviously play the track from beginning to end uh, at the end but uh, one of the moments that is very well known about the track is the six is the bass drum pattern the dum 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 which was actually um for those that uh, may want a bit of musical history was based on the uh, drum programming for Donna Summer's track Our Love, uh, produced by Giorgio Moroder. That's where New Order got the idea for that. Um, but this version at 127, it's a house version. It was qu- for 2014, 127 was quite on trend at the, mo- at the moment. It may be a little bit too fast. I don't know. Um, but I, I needed, I wanted to get that kick drum element in there. Now, now the thing is, if you've got a, in, in 1983, a kick drum that's running at sort of no lower than 100 hertz, i.e. not a lot of bass. If that goes go from, from dum, dum, dum to, you know, the bass, the energy in a contemporary bass kick drum would, be, would just destroy the place and just ruin the whole mix. So, and of course, the other element is I added a, a groove. So some of the elements, the, um, uh, the, the rhythmic elements, the 16th elements, uh, are either later, uh, a little bit later, to give it that kind of swung groove. It gives, you, it gives a bit of a funk element to drums and makes them less sterile. So everything's not exactly on the 16th. So there is a degree of that. So how did I actually um, incorporate the nod of respect to that 16th kick drum? So let's play it, the section, and then we'll, we'll break it down from, from, uh, from there. So here's the kick drum. Right, 
Right, so let's have a look at the actual kick drum track um, here. So basic, what I did was I kept the full dynamic momentum of, of the kick drum on the um, on the beat, the one, two, three, four, and the the sixteenth uh, notes or the groove sixteenth note, the all this. Uh, basically, I used the same kick drum but gave it a bit of a, a crisper sort of mid frequency element, but took the bass completely out. So by this way, you had the kind of you could hear that that element was happening, but it didn't, you know, the bass didn't just destroy the, the rest of the club or whatever, you, you know, your speaker system, uh, because the, the bass line was still happening. So this is what it sounds like on its own um, from here. And you can hear the bum ba dum ba dum ba dum it's, it's grooved, it's not straight 16s, listen. Bouncy mark, yeah, that's the one. So you can hear that the on the four four, the power, the energy is on the uh, on the on the f one two three four. So when you actually have the bass line in, in as well, which is here, and notice again it's on the sixteenth grooved. Okay, so that's how uh, I dealt with that. Now, at the end of that was the, the classic tch, 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 kind of thing. Um, that's my interpretation of it. So uh, let's have a look at uh, how that was um, programmed up. Uh, not so much recreated because it was such an incredible sound. So. Okay, so let's have a look. Here's the original hi-hats. And again, I sample these, uh, but then even with the actual pattern that it's playing, gave it a bit of a groove as well. Uh, and the effects were uh, oh, sorry, let's try that again. So that had to be in uh, no no doubt about it so uh, just to go back to that and listen to it again okay um now now would be a good time guys if you would like to start uh throwing some questions uh into the comments please because i'm kind of winding this up now a bit. So if you want to put some questions in and um, we'll take a, a quick Q&A towards the end of the session, I think I've been through every single element. I'm just gonna check my notes, uh, vocals, drums, percussion, uh, bass, guitars, chord strings, clavs, squiggle groove, persona and pro and answers. Um, yeah, uh, I think just about it. Um, just while you get the uh, the questions in, um, I'll I'll just show you the mastering chain on this as well. Uh, I think I can do this from uh, the overlay. Sorry, I'm using Ecamm Live here. Let's see if I can. Oh man, no, sorry, I've got it on uh, PDF. Sorry about that. One second. Let's go here again. And so um, back in twenty uh, twenty fourteen. Uh, get rid of that. Uh, so this was the mastering change. I, I didn't use, uh, because this was never, uh, I couldn't release it, obviously. I just um, wanted to do it. Uh, I, at, the, at the time, I had my 80s electropop radio show, so I kind of made it for that as well, but I had the parts I wanted to do it. Um, so I couldn't release it publicly, obviously. So I couldn't, you know, there's no point in sending it to a mastering suite or a specialist mastering engineer, um, people like... Um, Mutant bit mastering or guys at label works, for example. So back in 2014, I just mastered it myself. And this is the actual mastering chain for anybody who who's interested. Basically, the Brainworks plugin at the top right gives it a bit of the whole track, a bit of stereo separation, a bit of breathiness, a bit of life. Um, the um, uh, Doro EQ at the bottom, the Marg EQ at the bottom is just a general EQ of the track. 
uh, the um, Slate Digital. Um, it's kind of a warm uh, tape compressor for the Slate, you know, want of a better term, and just kind of like uh, controls the highs as well. I'm not too much of a fan of brick walling. I like the, the sections to breathe. If they drop, they drop. So I, I tend to keep everything leveled uh, and limited, but you know, give it give some dynamic room for uh, everything to breathe. So that's the that's the actual uh, mastering chain. If anybody is interested, uh, okay. Let's just go back to to this. Right. Okay. Questions. Let's have a look then. Let's have a look here. So let's. So John Ro John Davison, that cowbellish sounding thing in the four on the floor rhythm loop, swung groove as you put it, sounds a bit like the cowbellish sounding thing in percussion that begins to passion set me free. Is it? Where did it come from? Uh, no, it's not, John. Uh, that sound, uh, pretty much all of my drums, all of my percussion, uh, I use native instruments, battery. Um, I've used it for many, many years. That's my go-to uh, go to sort of source for, for, for pr drum program. I have a ton of samples. Um, obviously, uh, I mean, I'll, sometimes I'll use EXS24, which is uh, the, the uh, Logic Audio's built-in um, uh, sampler, but in essence, it's it's mainly uh, battery, native instruments, battery. Uh, so, Stefan, let's have a look. What are you asking? Um, Hi, Paul. I don't use Logic and really know so what's on your what's on your vocal channel. Um, of the, the, these are audio stems, uh, Stefan. So I I can't remember exactly what I had on the audio channel. Um, I, I, I probably some EQ, uh, maybe something that would add a bit of grit. Uh, I'll try and think of the actual plugin I use, Camel Fat. I think I used a, there's a plugin called Camel Fat, which I gave a bit of grit to the vocal and some kind of slapback reverb. It wasn't you know too much, but because the original stems uh, had an effect on them, so I couldn't you know I didn't I couldn't reverse and engineer them back to their raw form. Um, okay, let's have a look at another question. Jed, um, how do you how do you deal with the overall mix down in terms of balance volumes on each track and do you employ compression? Uh, yeah, I, what I tend to do, as I said I, in earlier on, I, I, I usually um, uh, kind of work on the, the feel. I, I find that EQing and compressing groups of tracks gently, not, you know, you can add compression to drums, gently layer compression you know don't overuse it um other elements like parallel compression etc but not not to go crazy and squash the heck out of these things but just gently build it up but i, I tend to sort of kind of master i master each section you know the percussion and the bass and everything you know as i'm going through so as i said by 90 odd percent of the time by the time i get to the end of the um, uh, at the end of the session, I, I pretty much got it, got it mastered and leveled. Any other questions? So has anybody um, got any, any other questions? Ah, here we go, Ashley. Uh, hi, Paul Rodwell. Did, did you use any sidechain compression? Not in this, not in this um, uh, remix, Ashley, no, not at all. There was no need for any sidechain compression in this because, I, I mean, if, if I shoot back to the bass line that had the missing note at the beginning and the way I've dealt with um, keeping the, the relationship between the kick drum and the bass, you know, there was, and there was no synth that needed that kind of pumping, um, uh, pumping sound. Did you say parallel compression or, oh, sidechain compression. Yeah. Sidechain of compression. Of course, I didn't need anything sort of sucking and pumping backwards as it were, you know, uh, this track wasn't really for that. Uh, question from Mark. Um, Hi, Paul, this is great. I have general remix in question. Would you normally use the same transitions effects through the track as in going from verse one to pre and then to chorus? Um, yeah, good question. I mean, you'll have seen that I, I basically, you know, I, I may make three or four different effects transitions to go through the track. I, I don't like the same um, effects transition going all the way through, for sure. Um, you know, that's not... Uh, that's not what what I want to do at all. Um, so I will make different effects transition and, and pepper them, sprinkle them through the track to, to give a bit more uh, of an interest. Um, Andrew, uh, was most of the, the mix done with plugins and software or did you sample with any external device and incorporate it back in? As I said, I think the Sequential Circuit Pro 1 I played and, sample, and, and, and put into the... Uh, into the uh, into the mix, uh, you know, with the audio file. But the 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 Moog bass was a Moog plugin. I think it was a Mini Moog, or I think it was one of the Arturia Moog uh, replications. So that that actually took care of the bass. The original bass line uh, bass, by the way, was a Moog Source, uh, and the drum machine uh, was an Oberheim DMX. 
So I, I, I uh, wanted to try and get as close to a Moog source as I could. And the only thing I had was a, a mini Moog uh, emulation. Uh, the strings and pads, by the way, they were um, originally the ARP Salinas and the Logan string machine. And again, what I said, I kind of recreated uh, that with, with the Mellotron uh, VST. Uh, so if you need those sounds, the ARP Salinas and the Logan string machine are the, the sounds to go for. Uh, most of the synths were done on uh, Profit 5. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a few things for you. Uh, let's have a look. Any more questions? Tom. Hey, Tom, how's it going? And Carolina, if you're there, do you use the ES2 to produce the synths as opposed to Roland or no, I, I, I don't think I've ever used ES2 on any, any production, to be honest with you. When it first came out, it was a novelty, but I, I don't really, don't really use it. Um, Jed, can you give me some tips on changing key on instrumental vocals? There's numerous ways of doing this. I mean, in Logic, you've got a, an audio suite. I mean, you can change uh, tempo using the flex time uh, flex time elements, where basically you can slice the groove into different sections and then change the tempo. And then using the audio inspector, you can uh, transpose the key up or down. It's not brilliant in in a in a sort of real time way. I'd recommend using something like Serato Pitch and Time or Serato Sample or some other audio processing. I tend to do a lot of the pre-production, the working out, the, the, the it's kind of arranging your, your ingredients. And then uh, once you've got all your ingredients in, ingredients in place, you begin to cook the meal. So it's, it's, it's like that really. Uh, John, it doesn't really relate to this mix in particular, but if you want to do a lot of editing of the two channel mix, say stutter edits, what tool would you use? Um, I would, pr I, I use a program called, um, well, I've, I've used for, I, I, I guess from the early 2000s, I, I, I would use uh, Logic and, and Pro Tools in tandem. I used to do a lot of my, um, what would be virtual tape editing or digital tape editing in, in, in Pro Tools. So, um, you know, I found it more, uh, I mean, for my very good friend uh, and mentor, Sunny X, uses Pro Tools for his full programming. But, you know, I used it primarily for, for editing waveforms. But I used a program called Peak as well, which isn't made anymore. Uh, but there are many solutions as well. But as regards bullet editing, and uh, without using a Chinograph pencil, um, uh, a razor blade and some and cut, cutting up tape, um, that's the, the only way to emulate that. Um, let's have a look what else we've got. Um, hi, Paul, what were you using when you did the Love to Hate You remix? Ah, okay. Well, that's a, a very big question, Stuart. Um, that's the, my remix of Erasure's Love to Hate You. Perhaps... We could do these these things more often if you guys really enjoyed it. Um, I could maybe dissect some of other remixes from the past if that would be of any interest. So uh, yeah, just uh, let me know. Um, what else have we got? Uh, Bruno, my goodness, how are you? Excellent, good to have you here. How much influence are Optimods in radio broadcast to your final mix? Uh, well, that's an area I'm not too familiar with, uh, Bruno, to be honest with you. I, know, I, I, I think what you're referring to is the, is the, the uh, compression and limiting and, and mastering kind of real time that, that radio stations do. As I said, I try and leave, I, I, I limit the, the dB level, the audio level, the volume level to a certain degree, but I always leave a certain amount of breathing space. I'm not a fan of brick wall and everything, so a vocal sounds as loud as a kick drum. So hopefully that uh, gives you an idea on that. Um, hey Steve, uh, do you use any time markers in your mixes? Right. Uh, Ziv, are you using time markers in your mixes? I can't see any cue marks in this mix. Uh, I said at the beginning, uh, Ziv, I, I don't have access to the original um, uh, multi track for this. It was lost on an old computer. So I, I only have audio, my own audio stems of this. So I, I, any cues and markers? I do use markers throughout the track, uh, but, but not in this particular case. Uh, let's have a look. What else have we got? Yes, yes. Oh, I guess that's been doing some other versions. Yes, please to more. Um, Dan, hi. This is a great classic. However, will we get to see you mix down anything you're working on? Ahem, yes. Yeah. Watch this space, everybody, for Utopia. Why you, number two, OPIA? We have a great collective uh, of, uh, of artists working together on this and m more, more good stuff to come from Utopia. Uh, let's have a look. Uh, Jed, H37 edit while simple is great program for stutter edits. Thanks for that tip, Jed. Um, I would like to hear more. Good question. Uh, let's have a look. That's a good question. Optimods, i.e. preparing for brick wall compression. 
Simon, have a chat with Bruno. You you obviously are much more knowledgeable on that than I am, but it's good to hear from you both and good to have you here. Um, yes, more remixes. Okay, so um, if there's any more questions, anybody would like to just find any more questions before I play the full track. So I'm actually going to... Um, uh, you've been very patient. Thank you for sticking with this and going through some of the technical stuff. I um, hope you've all enjoyed it. Um, I'm going to uh, play the track from top to bottom now. Hopefully this won't get get us thrown off Facebook, uh, but uh, at this stage, who cares? You've watched it already. There is a recording of this, I hope, in the background, so I'll try and upload this to YouTube as well for you guys, or you may be able to watch this on, on Watch Again. So I'm going to play the track for you now, and um, enjoy, okay? I'll uh, speak to you at the end of this.
How should I feel? 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 There you go. Hope you enjoyed it. Um, uh, yeah, it's been super cool to do this for you. I hope you've all uh, had a interesting, uh, entertaining time watching it. Um, I really, really enjoyed doing it for you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining uh, me today uh, with this. I want to say a quick hi as well to to Bruno Brooks. Thanks for joining, Bruno, as everybody. Uh, but just to say thank you, Bruno was one the first Radio 1 DJ that uh, gave me a break and started playing my mixes uh, back in the mid-80s. And, um, you know, uh, that was a great help back in, in those days. Thank you. And to everybody else who's a, a friend, a colleague, and Facebook friend, uh, people I've worked with, it's great to have you here. It's really good um, to to connect with you all virtually. Uh, and as Stuart, my other good friend here, said, uh, it's going to be uh, great when we can all meet up and hug again. Uh, so uh, in the meantime, uh, keep safe, keep well, look after yourselves. And um, uh, I think we'll be doing another one of these uh, in the near future. So thanks, everybody, for joining me on this. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Have a great uh, rest of the day. OK, bye for now. Hi everyone, just a quick addendum to today's anatomy of a remix session. Um, just wanted to throw this little video in just to clarify something. About halfway through the session, uh, yours truly got a bit confused about which was this reputed mistake synthesizer line that uh, Gillian had played. According to the Wikipedia page, this happened at the beginning of the track. It fades in with the, uh, the main drum beat, which is this section here. Now that's the section that I recreated over here uh, on my version, 127 BPM and in a different key. Which are pretty identical, obviously, apart from the actual tempo and the key. Um, but the part that I thought it was, or I was uh, of the impression that it was, was actually the clavinet section because over, over on the original, uh, that particular section I'd highlighted as what I thought was the mistake section here. And this is the uh, clavinet section, uh, which is here. So I pointed out that this particular rhythm sounded kind of strange on its own. 
especially when you heard it with the kick drum. So the version, assuming that that was the mistake synth, uh, on my version, I adapted uh, the clav, the funky clav, uh, to be uh, this particular pattern. So just to recap, this is what I thought was the original mistake. And this was what my reinterpretation was to correct what I thought was the original mistake. But evidently, according to the Wikipedia page on uh, further exploration, the um, actual synth in question was over on uh, this side here. So there you go. Confusing? Yeah. Anyway, it's part of the whole story of this remix. I just wanted to throw this little video in just to kind of either clarify or confuse you even further. But um, anyway, hope you enjoyed the uh, session earlier on. I will be doing another uh, Anatomy of a Remix session, and I will announce that again, what the track is going to be and when the uh, session is going to be live on Facebook. So thanks for attending. I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.